Today, I have the honor of interviewing Mr. Kamal Ahmed, the founder of the Asian University for Women. A remarkable educator and entrepreneur, Mr. Ahmed has been promoting education throughout his entire life. Mr. Ahmed, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I want to start with um, your work with the Asian University for Women. And currently, you reside on the Board of Trustees for the university. And as, the, as one of the founders, why do you believe it's important to focus specifically on helping women with their goals in higher education? What kinds of impacts can women specifically have, especially in communities where access to education might be a little limited? Yes, thank you, Anam. Um, you know, historically, there has been a lot of focus on primary education of girls. And the idea was that if you educate a girl in, through primary education, she will um, produce a lot, it will produce a lot of uh, social benefits. Um, as mothers, they will, they're more likely to inoculate their children, uh, send them to school perhaps, um, you know, overall improve the well being of the family and perhaps the whole community. Now, we had trouble with that view because it looks at women's education as entirely a derivative matter. You educate them so they benefit somebody else. What we are trying to do is, is claim education at any level is as much a right for women as it is for anyone else. And it is also a pathway for women to emerge in leadership positions. If you limit them to only lower levels of education, they will, they will be continually handicapped in rising up through the ranks and becoming leaders, thinkers, and so on. So we think higher education, particularly liberal arts education, which is what the Asian University for Women focuses on, uh, is important because it introduces perspectives that um, communities may not have, uh, and it, it endows those who are students with um, what the philosopher Martha Nussbaum has called the sovereignty of mind. And unless you have that sovereignty of mind, in some ways, you're never free. So that's why we think uh, it is important to provide opportunities uh, to women, particularly women who otherwise may not get any such opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. I think those kinds of implementations are creating revolutionary changes in, in education for women. And one thing I was especially interested in is because you're so hands on as one of the trustee members and founders of the university, do you have specific examples um, or instances that come to mind that are most memorable about women who have succeeded in the ways um, that you've outlined for them through the university? Yes, I, you know, we have had outstanding students and graduates, and I'll mention uh, since a few if, since you asked, but I think you also need to think that this is not um, a story of any one particular person. The kind of change we are hoping would come out of this enterprise is really the, would be the work of thousands of women who've graduated and have had embarked on um, the whole, their whole careers and, and preoccupations with changing societies. Now, we have had um, a student um, from, um, let's say, from Bangladesh who um, came from a, from a, small village outside of Chittagong. Um, this young woman came to AUW. Within a year or two, um, maybe two years, she was actually invited by Senator Durbin in, in Illinois to speak on youth empowerment issues. Um, she went on to Lund University in Sweden uh, for a year and then worked, uh, became the first one actually uh, in the profession, young professionals program of a major NGO in Bangladesh working on public health issues. Um, she went back to graduate school, this time at Oxford, 
and now is again back in Bangladesh um, leading um, the gender work of the World Food Program in the refugee Rohingya refugee camps. I think of her as a as a as a perfect model of what we had um, anticipated up to emerge out of this program. Here was this young woman, very talented, um, very bright, who because of her family circumstances uh, would have ordinarily been bypassed. Nobody would have really paid much attention to her talents because we were able to bring her in early on. Uh, not only did she have a chance to um, culture, you know, develop, cultivate her talents, she has now um, turned it around and serving others. So I think that's uh, those those examples are really um, there are tons of those examples in the profiles of our students and graduates. Um, yeah, and I think um, those sorts of specific stories are really inspiring. Um, and they're a testament to the kinds of, to the effects that these kinds of disciplines like the liberal arts studies that you've implemented at Asian University for Women can have. And if you wouldn't mind, could you elaborate a little more on those kinds of specific educational values like liberal arts education or what sorts of disciplines or philosophies you like to emphasize for women? Because there's more than just education here, there's cultures and stigmas that you need to break. So how do you guys uh, approach that? Yes, um, you know, liberal arts and sciences in our context is somewhat revolutionizing. Um, I'll explain what I mean. It's revolutionizing because the system at large of education in the region is one that stresses rote memorization and regurgitation. It sort of suspends a person's ability to think, to be challenged, uh, to be critical, to be analytical. Instead, it prizes your ability to remember and, and, and regurgitate uh, facts that are stuff that really may not be of any significance. What the liberal arts tradition in particularly in the US had developed is a way of getting people to think on their feet to look at evidence, to respect views of others, contest them on the basis of evidence, but at the end of the day, to carry that respect for others' views, for the diversity of views. Um, and you know, in the South Asian context, if you look back, uh, virtually every civil conflict or political conflict has been on the basis of religion, going back to the partition of India and Pakistan um, or ethnic conflict as in the case with Bangladesh and, and Pakistan. Um, and there are lots of micro struggles that are based on people's very narrow perceptions of what community they belong to. So what we are able to do um, is to bring young women from 18 different countries, from very many re religious groups, linguistic groups, ethnic groups, castes, um, and bring them in a melting pot of cultures, of values, uh, in the hope that by living side by side with people you may have imagined to be very different from you, you will in fact discover the commonalities that bind us. Um, so, and you know, it's also a question of developing trust as you see how people feel and think. Um, there is an element of rising trust, which I think is so critical um, for the future of the world, really. Um, so I think liberal arts education, I'm not saying professional or other types of education is not important, but at a basic level, liberal arts education um, can be quite empowering, uh, can be disruptive also. You know, I've had parents of students come to me and say, what have you done to our daughters? They don't want to listen to us anymore. Um, so, uh, but all of that I think is, 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 a, good, um, is a good result 
uh, in the hope that they will, in fact, um, get out of the traditional norms that may not be as appreciative of their individual talents. Yeah, and I think um, Asian University for Women's capacity to achieve those goals is what part of what makes it so special. Um, but another part that I wanted to focus on was um, this distinction with the Asian University for Women in that it targets individuals from underserved communities. So um, with a specific reference to the community of refugees, in what ways do you think access to education can specifically help refugees? I think access to education is probably the most important asset for any refugee. You know, think about it. They don't have a country. They have been uprooted. They have probably gone through enormous amounts of trauma in the process of being uprooted and having to flee. Um, there is, um, you know, many cases, refugee families have lost family members. They live in generally in sort of um, in dire situations and settings. Um, so what is there to give them hope other than the idea that they can actually, they're as smart as anybody else and they can get that education um, to both from their getting their own personal esteem, but also from the point of view of making something out of a life that has has been quite un unkind to them. Um, so, and what you see is also that in a lot of countries, the host governments will allow refugees to go to primary school, maybe secondary school, but they will not let them go to university. Um, so we felt at the Asian University for Women that it was particularly important for us to create opportunities from, for refugees from anywhere to come to this institution because there is no other place in the world that says, if you're a refugee, you're welcome here. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a very important dimension of our work. Absolutely. And given how crucial and meaningful those initiatives are with both women and with refugees, do you see any parallels between the two groups and the impact that education can have and the ways that education can empower them? Well, the parallels or similarities are, you know, women have been undervalued and been subjected to a tremendous amount of prejudice in many of our societies. Um, and refugees suffer from the same thing, you know. Uh, there is enormous prejudice, especially in times like uh, these where xenophobia um, um, is rising. Um, and, you know, so I think there are similarities between, between, you know, these two groups that you've mentioned, but really any, underprivileged or um, unequal um, parts of, um, of the society. Uh, it's probably just as applicable to ethnic minorities or religious minorities um, who, have, who are subdued in some ways by majority populations or views or practices. Um, so I think it's particularly, we have, we call it, um, our preferential option. We have a preferential option for women who are first in their family to come to university, women from communities that have struggled with oppression. Uh, I think it's really important to help those communities to get ahead through the education process. Yeah, um, and I think um, with more um, specific focus on the refugees, um, another really amazing thing about the Asian University for Women is that it's done significant work with the Rohingya refugees in particular, which is especially important given how large that crisis is, um, both in terms of the impact it's having on the Rohingya community, but also on the Bangladesh government and people. So what are your goals in targeting this specific group? Um, what do you think specifically this group, um, in what ways do you think they relate to education and can benefit from education specifically? 
Yes. <clears throat> now, you know, the, the Rohingya community um, has the same vulnerabilities as any other uh, oppressed people who have had to flee their countries. But it is also has certain disadvantages that are peculiar to this group, or at least uh, quite prominent in this group. That is that it's a very conservative society. And in that conservative society, the place of women historically has been most undervalued and unappreciated. Um, child marriages are rampant. Um, there's a lot of violence against women, in the, even in the camps. Um, so we thought in some ironic ways, the dislocation of the Rohingya community um, provided an opportunity to educate their women. Because, you know, in the process of being dislocated, the traditional ways of thinking have loosened. You know, a family which would have never thought of sending their daughter to university. Now they're stuck in a refugee camp. Um, you know, so if there is an opportunity, the viewpoints of yesteryear will not be um, as dominating. And as a result, you know, we have now 125 Rohingya women uh, attending the Asian University for Women. Um, and they are, you know, they're, they need more preparation to start the undergraduate program. That's because, you know, they're, they have not been to very good schools, but once that they reach that point of being fully prepared, they're just as good as anybody else. I would also say that, you know, one of the most uh, difficult parts of being in these situations is that you cannot even find your own voice. Somebody else is always speaking for you, whether it's garment factory workers like the ones we have at the Asian University for Women or the Rohingyas or the Tia state workers, they seldom get to speak for, for themselves. Somebody else from outside will speak for them. Um, I think it is important for these people to speak in their own voice. Um, and education of the type we are providing offers an opportunity um, for these communities to assert for themselves their right to speak their own mind and chart their own vision of what kind of future they would want. So I think from all of these points of view, um, educating women to higher levels of education becomes quite important. Absolutely, and I think those goals are really noble and also meaningful, especially because they're affecting so much real world change. So in order to think about more about how much, absolutely, and I think those goals are really noble and also meaningful, especially because they're affecting so much real world change. So in order to think about more about how much of that real world change we're really seeing with education, um, could you describe some projects or current initiative that you're doing with the Rohingya students at your university? Um, what, what kind of, you mentioned, you know, the preparation that they have to go through um, before they are ready for undergrad because of their prior experiences. What does that look like for them? Yes, um, <clears throat> the, the Rohingyas generally, students, Rohingya students will generally need two years of preparation. They spend the first year in an intensive English language acquisition program because the medium of instruction at the Asian University for Women is in English. So they've got to master that. The second part is once they have mastered English language, they still need to, oh, quite frequently um, more, they need to improve their skills in math, in academic writing, um, in their sense 
of um, the world at large. Um, so, so the first year is English and the second year then introduces a variety of uh, other topics and ways of learning. Um, again, taking them away from the rote memorization process that they have been inducted in for most of their educational careers. Um, and so implementing those kinds of curriculums, um, given that you're so hands-on and so connected with the Asian University for Women, what has your personal experience been like working with some of the Rohingya uh, refugee students? Could you speak to any of those and um, you know how they make you feel or certain things that might come to mind? I'm very proud of them, first of all. Um, what I have been struck by um, is how they're not our students from the Rohingya ethnic community are not, um, how should I say, they're not overwhelmed by the tragedy of their lives. Um, they're, um, they have tremendous hopes for themselves and for their community. Um, I, you know, recently I was talking to uh, one of our Rohingya students and she talked about doing a PhD. Um, she sent me a poem that she wrote, which is beautifully done about the possibilities of what the Rohingyas uh, can achieve uh, with their own land. Um, so I find um, quite unexpectedly and surprisingly knowing how harsh a life they have had to find that actually they're more optimistic than most people. The belief that they can in fact create a better future. Um, so I think that's good news for them and for the rest of us because if that, that sense of optimism is not diminished, it's not extinguished, then usually hope will ultimately um, prevail and transform into a better reality. Um, and you're mentioning how access to education has already provided them with some of these benefits of optimism and an ability to pull themselves out of the situation they find themselves in, which gives them strength and hope. Um, are there any other positive short-term effects that you've already seen education um, working for them, like achieving certain goals or um, pushing them towards certain new agendas or ideas that educate, education has provided for them in a really short-term notice? Because ultimately the Rohingya crisis is relatively recent and education efforts for them have been even more recent. So what in the short term have we been able to see um, in terms of positive changes? Yes, you know, the when the um, COVID-19 pandemic emerged, the people in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh were very suspicious for obvious reasons because they have encountered in their lives time and again um, situations which were purported to be something when in fact it was really quite something else. So when the word got out that there was this epidemic and they had to be restricted, they didn't believe any of it. Um, so these families started calling their daughters at the university and because they, they're their daughters, they trust them and they have the education now. So these young women from the Rohingya camps became the interpreters of what the outside world was saying to them. And I think it helped tremendously in, um, in persuading uh, people living in the camps to take on, um, you know, to abide by social distancing and other safe, safer practices to avoid um, affliction with COVID-19. Um, you know, what I would also say is that um, 
you know, the, uh, it's also what has brought out is that they are, what I was alluding to earlier, they're not self-indulging. The, because AUW sent all, most of its students back, not all, um, back in March or April last year, um, those who went back to the camps actually started uh, helping prepare other younger girls in the camps in a learning center at their own initiative. At their own initiative, they started a learning center. In fact, they contacted the UN um, women, um, which has a presence in the, in the camps and wrote me into talking with them, discussing their ideas. Um, but I was so impressed that they took that initiative and they've carried through um, with that, uh, with everything that they'd wanted to do. Um, so, you know, I know in some ways you think education has a, such a long gestational period before you can see the results. Well, in this case, we actually have started to see results quite early on. We have only been there three or four years and already you see the initiatives, the perspectives, the voices that have come up from them. Um, yeah, I think it's incredible that within such a short amount of time, so much positive change has already been affected. Um, and do you think that this positive change can continue to accumulate over the long run? Um, do you think that what or what sorts of long-term effects do you think continued access to education can have um, in on the large-scale um, context of the overall Rohingya crisis? Um, do you think this kind of continued access to education can really play a role in helping to solve the overall large Rohingya crisis? I would say, uh, but you know, I'm a partisan of for education. So I would say education is quite important in both steering um, the crisis to a just solution, which is for them to go back to their own land and have normal lives and norm have equal citizenship with the rest of Myanmar's people. Um, but the other part is, you know, if and when they go back, they have to reconstruct their societies. Um, and my sense is that these women who have come out of the camps and are getting an education at the Asian University for Women, they will never go back to the traditional mores of their communities. So they will have a view. They will have a view not only about themselves and their children, but of all of their community in terms of equality, in terms of how talents and skills are distributed in society. Um, so what is being perceived perhaps as a, as a privilege or as a rare opportunity for them to now come to AUW will become a right. It'll become a right for every girl to get the education that she wants. That's our hope. Um, and we have good reasons to believe that will in fact pass. Uh, um, so Talking about all this positive change that the Asian University for Women has been able to um, achieve, it tells you about the role that universities can play in helping to solve these larger humanitarian crises. Um, do you think that there is anything specific or any specific roles that universities across the globe, or maybe even more specifically in the US can play in helping to solve a crisis like this, whether it be the Rohingya crisis or other humanitarian crises in general? Well, um, universities are, are a vast network of intellectual and other resources. So um, when I look at the US universities um, going abroad, they seem to be mostly going to um, um, you know, high resource countries, um, Middle East, Singapore, um, you know, those seem to be sort of the destinations for a lot of US universities. 
um, to open branches or collaborate. And I understand that because even the most well-resourced in institutions of higher education at the end of the day have a scarcity of resources. But what it leaves out is the challenge of actually supporting education solutions to crisis in places where they may be most needed. It is in a place like Bangladesh, it is a, in a place like parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, where I would love to see American higher education have a more devoted role. And it's not just sort of thinking about crisis solutions, uh, but it's also, you know, redirecting some of the intellectual wherewithal, some of the scientific wherewithal to solving problems uh, that poor people face, you know, whether this is environmental issues, whether it's agricultural issues, it's health issues, whether they're, they're just conflict issues um, that need to be resolved. I think it would do, it would greatly benefit um, both parties, so to speak. It will benefit um, the people in these communities because they will have uh, the gift of knowledge or, um, from even if from places far away. And for US institutions, I think it can be also intellectually invigorating, right? Because you know, you're talking about real problems that, that trouble people. Um, I don't know what can be more exciting and fulfilling than being able to devote at least some of your um, gifts of intellectual gifts in that sort of a pursuit. So I would think that would be very beneficial. And at the Asian University for Women, we would of course love to welcome um, faculty from US universities uh, to come teach on a sabbatical for the summer for a few weeks. And many have come from Stanford and other places. And we want to promote that as a way of both learning and giving. Um, so do you think given all of that, do you think that American universities are somewhat in a special position, whether it be because of um, availability of resources or um, the kind of student bodies that typically attend uh, American universities? Do you think they have a specific role to play or a special position that they can use, um, a special platform that they can use to affect greater change? I mean, we would like all people, all universities, you know, to sort of think similarly, you know, uh, at least those who are, which are privileged, like the US universities. Um, you know, universities are in some ways a universal phenomenon, right? I can walk into any university anywhere and still feel more or less the same. Um, so there is that common language uh, and ethos that bind all true universities. So I think in some ways, this sort of exchanges, um, participation um, can be more easily achieved than for any other group of institutions. Um, and as you said, the US higher education is the most esteemed in the world today. Um, it is, has, because of how great they are, they also attract the, you know, the smartest people to both study and teach in these universities. So they have, I think, a particularly important role um, because you know, their involvement can actually catalyze breakthrough changes uh, on the other side. Um, well, Mr. Ahmed, it was a privilege to be able to interview you today. Thank you so much for your time and for your meaningful insights into the role of education in um, solving humanitarian crises around the world. I hope um, applicants can use some of the great advice that you just gave. Um, and um, I hope to work with you again in the future. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Take care.